Okay, I'm just taking a look at our screen to see who's back. Maybe 13 minutes wasn't quite enough. <laughs> Good, I see you. people are chewing still. <laughs> All right. Good, do we, do we have a quorum so that we can start? Yes, we do. Thank you. All right then. Next is a certification committee. Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo, will you please convene the committee? Uh, yes. Pull up my script. Okay. I now convene the December 2020 meeting of the certification committee. The committee has one item before it today. I would like to remind members of the public that wish to speak on a specific item to please email your request to comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-6253 and indicate which item you wish to speak to. The meeting host will change the individual's permission and ask that they turn on their camera and unmute their microphone to share their comment. At the conclusion of the speaker's comments, the meeting host will remove the individual's permission and their camera and microphone will be disabled. Item 3A presents proposed amendments to Title V of the California Code of Regulations pertaining to bridge authorizations for the new special education credentials. This is an action item and will be presented by Josh Speaks. Mr. Speaks, will you please begin? Good morning, commissioners. Um, as the chair stated, this item proposes amendments to Title V of the California Code of Regulations that are necessary to implement a pathway that would allow current holders of special education credentials to earn bridge authorizations, giving them the same scope of practice as the new credentials going into effect in 2022. Um, it's important to emphasize that this is an optional authorization. It will not be required by the commission and current credential holders will remain authorized to do anything that their credential currently allows. So just to recap where we are in this process, these bridge authorizations are part of the overall restructuring of our special education credentials, uh, which the commission has been working on over the last several years. Historically, when we um, modify or expand a credential, the commission also offers a way for existing credential holders to obtain the new authorization without having to complete an entirely new preparation program. Of the five new special ed credentials, only three early childhood special education, mild to moderate support needs and extensive support needs will have changed authorizations. When this was discussed in October, I'm not sure that the item made it clear that we would be creating bridges for all three of the credentials um, because there were a couple of places where uh, it mentioned the mild, moderate and the extensive without uh, mentioning the early childhood special education. So I just wanna be clear that we will be creating bridges for all three of these credentials if, um, if this item is approved by the commission. The visual impairment and deaf and hard of hearing credential authorizations uh, remain the same. And so no bridge process will be necessary for those credentials. Um, as per the commission's direction at your last meeting, these regulations allow competency in the new TPEs covered by these authorizations to be demonstrated by completing coursework, uh, professional development, or demonstrating competency via um, a portfolio or other uh, practical method of demonstration or a combination of multiple methods. Uh, the regulations would allow a, a approved preliminary education specialist programs, um, local educational agencies and uh, certain statewide organizations to verify to the commission that a current education specialist has met the new TPEs. Um, so with that, Overall introduction, I will go into some of the specific changes that are, well, all the specific changes that are actually made by the regulations. So in sections 80047 through 80047.4, uh, we're adding the names of the new credentials along with language um, that is intended to change the focus of our regulations from complying with federal disability categories to language emphasizing the focus on support needs. Um, 
We're also removing some terms that um, when they were first put into the statute were um, terms that were used in federal law, but um, are no longer used. So um, we're removing those and replacing them with the, the current federal terms, um, as well as an obsolete deadline that's in 80047.2. Um, in sections 80048.3.1 and 80048.3.2, the terms level one and level two have been changed to preliminary and clear for out of state and out of country prepared teachers. And that just brings them into accord with the terminology used for in-state prepared teachers. Um, an outdated requirement that these education, that, that these educators earn a master's degree or complete 150 hours of additional training has been removed because that requirement was eliminated uh, from the education code um, by uh, a, a legislative change. References to the new mild mod uh, support needs, severe support needs, and early childhood special education credentials are also added, along with the January 1st, uh, 2023 implementation date. The requirements that holders uh, must verify completion of a preparation program before they can hold a clear credential and removed. Um, next, the preliminary education specialist teaching credential program standards and uh, teaching performance expectations that you adopted in 2019 are incorporated by reference in section 80048.5. Um, in section 80048.6, the five new education specialist credentials, the bridge authorizations and their authorization statements have been added. Um, and there are two minor changes in this section that are not reflected in the item in front of you. Um, they, came to my attention um, with, without enough lead time to get you an insert. So I wanted to um, bring them to your attention and explain. Um, first, the language that we will submit with your approval will say kindergarten, including transitional kindergarten in the mild, moderate and extensive support needs authorization statements. Um, the language in the agenda item doesn't include the phrase including transitional kindergarten. Now that's because it reflects the language the commission approved several months ago. Um, the intent of the language is always that these credentials would authorize teaching in a special education transitional kindergarten setting. Um, so this isn't a policy change. We didn't believe it was necessary to specify that because from the standpoint of the commission staff, TK is kindergarten. Um, however, we've been hearing from the field that it sometimes confuses administrators who are unsure whether or not they're able to assign those um, teachers to a uh, special ed TK setting. So we wanted to add an explicit mention of transitional kindergarten in order to clear up any confusion. Also, the authorization statement for an early childhood special education added authorization that's been earned under the new TPEs says birth through pre-K, um, but the early childhood special education and um, the bridge authorization offers teaching up through kindergarten rather than pre-K. Um, this was just a typographical error on my part. And so uh, we will be changing this language to reflect that and showing that the added authorization also authorizes teaching through kindergarten uh, consistent with the credential and bridge. Since these items are not part of the item itself, um, if the commission does approve of those changes, um, it will need to explicitly be stated in the motion. Um, so you would have to say something like, you know, approve this item, as well as the addition of a reference to TK in the mild mod and extensive authorization statements and the change to kindergarten in the early childhood special education added authorizations. So I'm sorry that I accidentally made this more complicated than it had to be. Um, section 80048.7 has been updated to reference uh, current commission forms. It just had um, out of date forms listed there. Section 80048.8 .8 has been updated to reflect a change in numbering in the education code. Section 80048.10 is being added here to actually create the bridge authorizations effective January 1st of 2023. Um, and so this is sort of the, along with the authorization statements, this is the real meat of the changes that we're making. What this session does, the section does, is it specifies that you have to hold the corresponding existing credentials. So if you're, um, if you hold a mild mod, then you can get the mild mod bridge authorization, et 
etc. Um, it can be either preliminary or clear and that you have to demonstrate competency in specific TPEs. And we've actually enumerated um, in that section exactly which TPEs you have to demonstrate the competence in for each bridge document. And then uh, we go on to say that the competence can be demonstrated, like I said, by either the completion of coursework through a commission approved preliminary special education program sponsor, completion of professional development courses offered by an approved preparation program, an LEA, a SELPA, or a state educational agency that adopts an appropriate curriculum for that purpose, or um, by confirmation of prior knowledge and experience via demonstration. So, you know, submitting a portfolio, um, evaluations from, you know, your, your employer, those, that sort of thing. So um, I know that's a lot of information. Um, I am happy to answer any questions or go back over any of it, uh, you know, as, as needed. Um, and with that, uh, we recommend approval of these changes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaks. And Mr. Speaks, can you um, clarify and repeat those two things that need to be included again? Yes. Um, okay. Sure. So um, it would need to explicitly be stated in the motion that um, the addition of references to transitional kindergarten in the mild, moderate, and extensive support needs um, authorization statements is approved. And also to change the reference from pre-kindergarten to kindergarten in the early childhood special education added authorization. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, we will now open for public comments. Uh, reporting secretary, are there any public comments? Harold Acord. Hi everyone, again, this is Harold Acord speaking on behalf of the 300,000 plus members of the California Teachers Association. And first off, I would like to uh, praise the commission for the work that they've done on this item, for the work that they've done on these Title V regulations. We really appreciate it. And we feel like it does reflect a lot of the concerns and questions and things that we felt were needed in order to um, make this even better. So we wanna praise you again for that. And um, specifically, we like the part that says, an individual who possesses a preliminary or clear mild moderate education specialist credential, et cetera, um, or their equivalent may at their sole discretion apply for an education specialist bridge authorization. And um, again, we really feel like that's very clear. We hope that um, you'll be able to, in what you put out to the greater community, make that very cl clear to emphasize, say it again and again. And we think that that will help a lot of people where they know that it is at their sole discretion and when em employers understand that too. So that's the concern that we have. And um, uh, we just want to encourage you to continue making that clear for everyone. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Mr. Acord. Uh, recording Secretary, are there any others? No, we have no additional requests. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments on this item? Student Liaison Jones? Yes, I just want to echo what um, Mr. Acord just said. I know I talked to my peers about this. And um, a lot of them are getting their prelims right now in mild, moderate, moderate, moderate to severe. And that was one of their concerns. And um, I just wanna echo that importance of making sure employers know it's at the discretion. And um, I also wanna ask a question. Um, they asked me this question and I was like, I don't know. Um, but if they were to go through that bridge and get say um, a student who is um, mild, moderate, um, they got their clear credential and now they wanna do the um what is it the mild to moderate support needs does their credential um go away or now do they have two uh, they would they would have two documents they would have their existing credential and then they would also have this bridge authorization 
Um, but functionally, and Aaron can correct me if I'm wrong about this, um, functionally, they're only really ever going to have to worry about the one document because the, the bridge authorization continues to exist as long as they're renewing their actual uh, mild mod credential. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, they would have one document and how their authorization would appear on that document. We haven't quite worked out those technical details yet, whether their mild to moderate would remain and then they would have an additional authorization or whether we would replace the mild moderate with the new full broad authorization. We haven't worked out those details yet, but they definitely would only have to maintain one document. Awesome, thank you so much. Right. Commissioners, any other questions or comments? I'm looking at the screen and our participants list. All right. Commissioners, this is an action item. Do I have a motion to approve the proposed regulatory amendments to begin the rulemaking file for submission to the Office of Administrative Law? Um, including the two additional references um, as mentioned in the item. All right, I have a motion by Commissioner Chair Sloan. Do I have a second? All right, seconded by Commissioner Hines. Any further discussion? All right. Will the recording secretary call for the vote, please? Kirsten Barnes. Aye. C. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. Aye. Johanna Howitt. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Terry Jackson. Aye. Bonnie Clark. Aye. Kevin Kung. Aye. Jim Marks. Aye. Cynthia Martin. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Tina Sloan. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you, Mr. Speaks, for your presentation. This concludes the business before the certification committee. The committee is adjourned. Thank you, Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo. Next is a cert uh, sorry, next is a professional practices committee. Commissioner Cooney, will you please convene the committee? I will, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. At this time, I will convene the meeting of the Professional Practices Committee. Uh, we have a one item before us today, uh, a workload report from the Division of Professional Practices. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gonzalez is not able to join us today. He's not feeling well, but we have uh, Vanessa Whitnell, our Chief Counsel, and um, Ms. Whitnell, are you prepared to go forward? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Cooney. Uh, I will be providing the information for the October 2020 workload report for the Division of Professional Practices. The total caseload for the division was 2,402 cases, which is slightly below the normal range of 2,600 to 2,800 cases. The Committee of Credentials reviewed 89 cases at initial review and 94 cases at formal review, which is much higher than the normal number, but that is because they were holding the five-day makeup meetings and that was their last makeup meeting. So uh, they are fully caught up and should be resuming their normal caseload next month. Staff opened 297 cases, which is below the four to 500 average. Staff closed 305 cases, on commission delegation, which is also just slightly below the normal range of four to 500. And in October, there were 141 pending cases at the Office of the Attorney General, which is within the normal range. 
And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from commissioners? Uh, I have one, uh, Ms. Whitnell, the cases opened um, seems quite a bit below uh, October of last year. And uh, I'm not sure actually cases open for the last three months uh, have been below. Is that a function of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic or is there some other explanation? Our application numbers have been down due to the pandemic. We, we do not anticipate that the lower number of cases will become the norm. Once there's a, a vaccine and teachers go back to the classroom, uh, we anticipate a full recovery of our application numbers. So this is probably a blip in time due to the pandemic. And as soon as we see teachers returning and there's a vaccine, uh, we think we'll be back to our normal numbers. Thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Hartwood. Michael, you took my um, question. That's what I was going to ask as well. And Ms. Whitnell has um, answered that. Ms. Whitnell, do you have any concerns about a, a surge in number of cases where you might rise above even what our average numbers are and that could create any kind of a staffing issue for you? We always have that concern. I, of course, there is a massive teacher shortage and this has only been amplified by this pandemic. So when we have a vaccine and teachers are returning to the classroom, it's possible that we could have a, a large spike in applications and then a large spike thereafter in the DPP with the misconduct. We have had that in the past. It ebbs and flows. I, I do know that we were at 105 cases in the committee at one point. So uh, it's possible and Gil and I do our best between both the legal office and the division of professional practices to ensure that our staff um, are fully trained to back each other up. So if that occurs, we're gonna hold tight and get the numbers through. Thank you for that. And I hope that you will just keep us informed if you see that there are crunches that you can't meet. And again, I just wanna repeat my um, sincere thanks to the very hard work that the DPP does and that your office does to keep this really important work on behalf of credential holders and uh, children moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hartwig. You, uh, you stole my line. Um, it's really quite incredible that uh, the committee has been able to keep up with uh, all of the appearances by uh, adding an extra two days to some of their monthly meetings, I guess going back to April. And um, really it, it has become a full-time job and that's the only way they could have kept up. So I hope if you have a chance to pass to Mr. Gonzalez and through him to the committee, um, our appreciation of their extra efforts, you'll be able to do that, Ms. Widow. I will do that. And for that matter, it really applies to uh, the entire uh, commission. Um, I know people, we keep seeing a shot of that empty room and it makes me realize while the building may be largely empty, uh, work is going on on a daily basis. And um, I've talked with Mary several times and, and, uh, and she assures me that uh, no, uh, no task that needs to be done is, is being left undone. And uh, it's terrific leadership. And, and due to that, that uh, the commission as a whole is able to function without missing a step. So uh, it should be said all the time. I often forget to say it, but I wanted to today. Okay, other commissioners, comments, questions? Good, okay, then we can adjourn the meeting of the Professional Practices Committee and I'll return, return the agenda to the chair. Thank you, Commissioner Cooney, and, and thanks for the acknowledgement of the work that the Committee on Credentials is doing. Everybody is working harder at this point in time. Everything, it seems to be harder, and that committee was already working beyond, above and beyond, so I would 
again um, echo uh, our, our whole appreciation of the commission. Okay, next is the legislative committee. Uh, Commissioner Hind, will you please convene the committee? Absolutely. I now convene the December 2020 meeting of the Legislative Committee. The committee has one item before it today. I would like to remind members of the public that wish to speak on a specific item to please email your request to comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-6253 and indicate which item you wish to speak to so we can call your name during the appropriate time. Please make sure the request includes your full name, phone number, if participating through the phone only, your affiliation and the agenda item number and title. Make sure the name you provide matches the name used to join the meeting. At the appropriate time, the meeting host will change the individual's permissions and ask that they turn on their camera and unmute their microphone to share their comment. At the conclusion of the speaker's comments, the meeting host will remove their individual's permission and their camera and microphone will be disabled. Item 5A is the 2021 Legislative Outlook. This is an information item that will be presented by Sasha Horwitz. Mr. Horwitz, when you're ready, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. So while we may be at the end of 2020, um, we're already at the beginning of the new legislative session. Today, I'll provide an update on the outlook for the 21 legislative session, which officially begins on Monday, when the current class of senators and assembly members are sworn into office. The legislature will then recess and reconvene on January 4th to begin formal legislative activity. As always, I like to begin by orienting us to the current point in the legislative cycle before moving on to provide specifics on any bills. Following last month's election, the state assembly will swear in all 80 members of the current class for a new two year terms. And because the Senate has staggered terms, it will swear in 20 of the 40 senators to four year terms. They will have until February 19th to introduce the bills they wish to carry for 2021. Once introduced, the bills will be assigned to a policy committee, for example, the Education Committee, where they will be debated on the merits by committee members with input from stakeholders and members of the public. Bills that receive enough votes to pass out of their committees are then sent to the floor for a final vote of the full body, unless the bill has a significant fiscal impact. These bills first take a detour to the Appropriations Committee before they can move to the floor. Successful bills then cross over to the other house, that is assembly to Senate or vice versa, where they repeat this process. Any bill that passes both houses heads to the governor for his signature. And with few exceptions, signed bills will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Bills that do not complete the legislative process in 2021 may have a second chance as a two-year bill and continue the journey through the legislature in 2022. Any bill that does not pass in 2022 is considered dead and will have to be introduced again after the next statewide election. Moving on a parallel track, the governor will introduce his initial version of the 21-22 state budget by January 10th. This budget and its related trailer bills include both the administration spending and policy priorities. The budget is sent to the legislature for debate by the budget committees. In May, after the state updates its fiscal projections for the year, the governor must submit a, a revised budget. This budget may be substantially different from the January version for any number of reasons, such as actions taken by the legislature in response to the administration's proposals, public opposition, changes to the state's fiscal landscape, or other urgent matters that arise. The May revision budget must be passed by both houses of the legislature by June 15th. The governor then has until July 1st to sign the budget, which goes into effect immediately. As you'll recall, in 2020, the commission sponsored two bills. The first was AB 2541, our pre-accreditation clarification bill. This simple bill would have streamlined the definition of a regionally accredited institution of higher education. It also would have clarified that the commission has the authority to establish regulations recognizing that a degree conferred by such an institution in the process of being accredited will be considered valid for credentialing purposes once the institution is successfully accredited. The regional accreditation process can take more than five years, and this closes a loophole that prevents students who graduate from a pre-accredited institution from being able to become teachers just because they happen to graduate before the institution and its program of study 
completes its regional accreditation process. The other commission sponsored bill was AB 2485, or bill adding flexibility to subject matter or CSET requirements by allowing a candidate to demonstrate that they meet the subject matter requirement for the credential they are seeking through prior college coursework and or a mix and match of CSET scores and coursework. Both of these measures passed out of the state assembly with unanimous support and no opposition. However, they died last session without being granted a hearing in the Senate Education Committee because the committee only considered bills that were directly related to the state's COVID-19 response. In both cases, I'm pleased to report that the authors, Assembly Member Medina for the pre-accreditation bill and Assembly Member Kalra for the subject matter bill, have agreed to reintroduce the bills in the 2021 session. Staff will provide updated bill numbers once the bills are in print early next year. There are two other bills that staff closely monitored in 2020 and expects to be reintroduced next year. The first of these is AB 1982 by Assemblymember Cunningham which would give teacher candidates more flexibility to pass the basic skills requirement by allowing candidates to de demonstrate proficiency through letter grades of B or higher in specified college coursework. The commission took a support position on this measure last year, or rather earlier this year, after the author accepted your recommended amendments. However, like the other two bills, AB 1982 died when it was denied a hearing in the Senate Education Committee. The final bill that staff expects to be reintroduced in 2021 is the Reading Instruction Competence Assessment, or RECA, bill, SB 614. This measure was carried by Senator Rubio, who would have made substantial changes to the RECA statute and integrated the exam into the teaching performance assessments. While the bill died in the Assembly Appropriations Committee last session, stakeholders have indicated they plan to reintroduce the measure with modifications, and staff understands that Senator Rubio plans to reintroduce the bill. Commission staff has been working closely with the legislature and stakeholders to provide technical assistance and analyses that ensure the enacted version of the bill will be workable in the current environment. The commission will continue to work with legislative staff, the administration and stakeholders to monitor all bill proposals impacting the commission's work. We'll report back to the commission on these in early spring 2021. This concludes my presentation on item 5A. Thank you commissioners and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Horwitz. That was excellent. We are now open for public comment. Uh, recording secretary, are there any public comments? Yes, we have Sharon Merritt. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Sharon, are you there? Sharon, can you turn on your camera and uh, uh, unmute your mic, please? There we go. So sorry. Um, uh, thanks for taking my comments. I'm Sharon Merritt, Associate Professor at Fresno Pacific University and president of the California Association for Bilingual Teacher Education. Um, I'm commenting on SB 614 and future initiatives on the replacement of RECA. Today, I wanted to convey that COBTE will continue to collaborate closely with both our coalition partners, including CABE, CTA, AXA, CSESA, and public advocates, as well as CTC staff on future legislation and initiatives to replace the RECA with a more authentic and effective and equitable form of assessment for reading instruction. We are committed to representing the interests and needs of bilingual pre-service teachers and students and to working with the dyslexia community to satisfy their concerns about the needs of students with dyslexia. And to Terry Clark, all of us in teacher preparation programs so deeply appreciate you and will miss you Cobte wishes you a wonderful retirement. And with that, I'll end my comment. Thank you so much. Do we have any more public comments? No, we do not. All right. 
having no more public comments, the public comment period for this item is over. Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments on this item? Um, Commissioner Marquita, <coughs> sorry, Green and Shire. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to commend Mr. Horowitz for his presentation. He always starts with this really clear overview of a very complicated process and walks us through. So thank you very much. Great. Other commissioners? All right, seeing none, this is an information item, so no action is needed at this time. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. And this concludes the business before the legislative committee. The committee is now adjourned. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Hind. I would now uh, like to reconvene the general session and continue our discussion on item 1A, the strategic plan planning work group session. <clears throat> I know that uh, Amy Rising and Mary Sandy will be uh, leading us through this work. And I believe Mary Sandy will start us off, Mary. Yes, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Rhonda Brown, could you please begin the PowerPoint for us? Thank you so much. And if you'll advance to the next slide. Next slide, please. While she's doing that, uh, let me just uh, say that our time with you commissioners and members of the public uh, on Wednesday for a deep dive into uh, feedback we've received from the field was, was highly valued by all of us on this, at the staff level. Um, we rarely have the opportunity for this kind of in-depth discussion around our vision, mission, goals, objectives, work with you. And we, we very much appreciate those of you who could take the time to do that with us. Um, and we're thrilled now, of course, to bring in those of you who were unable to be with us on uh, on Wednesday, um, I want to reiterate that the work we're doing around strategic planning is a process. Uh, and Wednesday was really intended to be a process where we used a project-based learning approach, if you will, to dig into how a group of stakeholders that responded to our survey are perceiving us, perceiving the work we do, perceiving, uh, you know, expressing their own needs around, uh, you know, what, what our mission might be and how our mission might be enhanced or, or understood by them, what things we should begin doing, what things we might stop doing. It was, it was uh, just a very good opportunity to look through this material and to really talk through what does it mean and what are the implications for our strategic plan. We started with a goal, a set of goals for this, and really the intent was to increase commissioner familiarity with the strategic plan itself and with our statutory mandate. Um, there are many, many things we might like to do. There are some things we are charged to do uh, and funded and staffed to do. And part of our uh, work with you commissioners will be to sort uh, across the things we'd like to do and really identify the highest priority pieces of work that fall within the mandate that we have. And to consider if, if it really appears to be necessary, if there are any areas of mandate that we think we ought to have, which is a different conversation altogether. But goal one was really to use this material to grapple with and come to terms with what are the things we're doing and how is that received. Um, secondly, we really wanted to give you the opportunity to, to work with it and to, to narrate it and to think about and begin to express some of your own ideas about uh, our mission, our vision, the values that have guided the work, the goal structure and the, the kinds of activities that we've been engaged in. Uh, so that, that you really could, could be in that narrative with us. Um, and then finally, the work that our, we plan to do and are, are going to do take the next little bit of time to do is to reflect on and weigh this feedback uh, that we've received against the current commission goals and begin to, uh, to ideate about what the next set of goals might be for the year 2021 and beyond. Um, so, so really, that's what we were about on Wednesday. That's what we'd like to do some reflection on today. Uh, with you as we uh, bring this meeting to its, its close, probably I would guess within the next hour or so. Um, so with that, I would like to turn it back over to Amy Rising, who was our very able facilitator on, uh, on Wednesday. You, you got uh, to taste 
uh, and feel some of the, <laughs> the ways in which our performance assessment uh, design teams are working uh, because this is how Amy uh, does this work uh, with them. It's a very um, deliberative process of engagement, breakout, come together, build ideas together. So thank you, Amy, for stepping in and, and helping to facilitate this work. And I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Mary. And good morning, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, glad to be back with you today. So Rhonda, please go to the next slide. We want to just um, make sure that you are all familiar. We know some of you are joining us today, but these were the items and materials that we used on Wednesday throughout our discussions and throughout that session. And so just a quick reminder, you have your insert that provides the charts, the data charts and the written summaries uh, that were <coughs> taken directly from the stakeholder feedback we received in the survey. And then you also have the link in the strategic planning working session insert, uh, the link that will take you directly to the raw data itself. So I invite you to find those documents um, and take a look at them as we move through time here together. But I just want to remind you that these are the materials we use. So next slide, Rhonda. We just wanted to step back and remember uh, where our current direction uh, lies. And so our primary mission by EdCode is about issuing credentials and licensing California educators, accrediting educator preparation programs, including establishing standards uh, and teaching performance expectations, administrative performance expectations, early childhood expectations, et cetera, and to monitor and address educator misconduct. Next slide. Vision and mission. So our current vision and mission are as follows. Our vision is that all of California students, preschool through grade 12, are inspired and prepared to achieve highest potential by well-prepared and exceptionally qualified educators. And our mission is to ensure integrity, relevance, and high quality in the preparation certification and discipline of the educators who serve all of California's diverse students. We'll come back to these two statements as we come into our discussion questions for today. So next slide, Rhonda. We also have a core set of values and Mary mentioned these a minute ago. And I'll just give you a second to take a look and remember what our core beliefs are. Um, we have several. We recognize and promote excellence in the preparation and practice of California's education workforce. We value and promote equity, quality, inclusiveness, and diversity in standards, programs, practices, people, and the workplace. We're dedicated and committed to the education and welfare of California's diverse students. We value the voices, ideas, and understanding of educators, parents, students, our partners, stakeholders, and employees. And finally, we embrace the spirit of innovation that enables us to transform our vision into reality. Next slide. Now, if you think back to Wednesday, those of you who were able to be with us, the data that we presented to you for your consideration and discussion in this first look at that response from our stakeholders, we put that into the four broad goal areas that we have for our work at the commission. And those four areas include issues and activities related to educator quality, program quality and accountability is our second area. Our third goal is communication and engagement, how we communicate and engage with our stakeholders, our constituents, our teacher candidates, our teachers, our mentors, our administrators, our paraprofessionals, everyone, our professional uh, services, credential holders, all that we work with. And then finally, our fourth goal, operational effectiveness. How are we doing the work to support all of those stakeholders and constituents in the world of public education and education in California and all of our diverse settings? Next slide. So again, if you remember back to Wednesday, we introduced uh, the survey questions to you. We have quite a number of questions um, starting with uh, questions three and four that we briefly, Mary and I walked you through around the purpose and mission of the commission. And that's why today we kind of took a minute there to revisit our purpose and mission. 
And then we had our first real stakeholder feedback question, which is what is the commission doing well? And what services or support is the commission providing that should be continued? And we looked at that data. And then we moved on and spent the majority of our time together looking at questions five and six in the morning, and then moved on to seven and eight in the afternoon. So in the morning, we looked together at and discussed what stakeholders told us they would like to see the commission start doing. What is the agency not currently doing that we could be doing to be helpful to the field? That was our first question. Our second was what should the commission stop doing? So what should we start doing? What should we stop doing? That was our morning discussion. We took a lunch break and we came back to two more questions. What areas of policy, if any, need to be updated? So given our current policies that are in place, which should be revisited? Which should we rethink about or study? And then we followed that with, given all of the data we've seen and the feedback at this point in time in this early discussion that we're having with you, what new policy areas should the commission take up? What did the feedback tell us that our field is saying that we should take up? What new policy areas? Now, question nine, we didn't have a chance to look at with you yet, but we will. And that was just feedback on what everyone was satisfied with what we are in fact currently doing. And we do have some good feedback there that we will share with you in the future. Um, the kinds of things that we are doing that our field finds useful, helpful, supportive. So again, four questions uh, on Wednesday that we dug into and we have begun internally to take a look at that feedback on that OneDrive uh, chart that we all built together and that you all have a chance to share with each other a little bit. So with that, Rhonda, let's go to the next slide, please. Remember, we also uh, had quite a sorting activity um, in which we took all of the feedback, stakeholder feedback we got, and not only um, sorted it into the four main goal areas, but we also, uh, by looking at the data and the frequency of responses, came up with these 15 activity categories. So again, just to remind you, uh, we brought the data forward to you for your reflection and discussion around recruitment and grants, testing, performance assessments, educator misconduct, and we all pondered together and wondered about why uh, we didn't see too much there. Um, educator preparation, saw a lot, accreditation, communication, stakeholder engagement. We also had data that fell into the category area of credentialing and technology use. There were comments that came to us around funding and how that might operate in the future. We talked about some research ideas that came to the forefront that were shared with us, data and how we're collecting it, how we're using it. Uh, a theme that ran throughout all the questions was diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then we also had quite a bit of feedback around early childhood and the desire to bring early childhood into the forefront of the work at the commission. And then we had a general area that caught all the rest of that important feedback that didn't quite fit in. We didn't want to lose anything at this point in the discussion and reflection. So hey, before yes, we, Mary, jump in. Yeah, before we go to the next slide, I just, I just want to reiterate that we, we received 82 responses to this survey. 61 of those were from individual educator preparation pro, or institutions that are offering uh, educator preparation programs. 21 of them came from organizations but 90% of the responses that we received are from entities that are involved directly in teacher preparation of some kind and educator preparation across credential areas. So yeah. this was one uh, survey opportunity and that the emphasis really that you found in these data uh, was coming from a, a perspective largely of the preparation industry uh, that we work so closely with. Very important perspective. A lot of our work is done around that. Um, but uh, so, so just, you know, this was the first time <laughs> that we got a chance to look at that. What we did in digging deep across these questions uh, helped us to see and understand what do they think we should start doing, stop doing, and involve ourselves in policy around. What we haven't had the opportunity to do yet is to look across uh, these categories and to really tease out. Um, there's a fair amount of repetition. If you take the topic of recruitment and grants, for instance, you'll find that uh, we got good responses that this is an area of work the commission is doing well. We got some responses around recruitment intention about work we should start doing. 
we got some feedback around things we should stop doing around recruitment. So the next level of analysis for us is to take a look at how these, how these topics narrate across these topics of start, stop, update, or introduce new policy. And we'd like to take that, uh, the opportunity with those data and uh, with the, your initial kind of responses and engagement with that data to prepare um, the next agenda item that we have in front of you probably in February. So I just wanted to say that before we move on to the questions that we'd like to organize you, your conversation around next, Amy. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you. All right, so next slide, please, Rhonda. So here is where we need all of you to re-engage with us. We have a few more questions we'd like you to pause and ponder and wonder about out loud with us and think about. Uh, so I'm going to go over them quickly, and then we're going to move right into a discussion. So um, when we have this kind of data, and as we begin to work to code it and reflect on it and think deeply about what we're receiving, um, we need to, at some point, move on to saying, okay, how will we prioritize these uh, findings? So the first two questions are about that. One question, of course, is what are the priority areas for our short-term goals at the commission? What is it that we need to get on right away? What do we need to address immediately in this next year? And uh, what, 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 are, what is emerging uh, from this one source of feedback from multiple uh, organizations and many of our education preparation programs? What are the short-term goals? That's followed, of course, by thinking about, so what are our longer term goals? Which of these um, aspects of the commission's work might take more than one year to accomplish or must be looked at continuously over time? So what are our long-term goals? Then we'd like to know more about your thinking after you've had a chance to look a little bit at the data and maybe you thought about it over the last 24 hours or so, but what uh, and how are you thinking that what we've been looking at from stakeholder feedback, how might that impact our current vision, mission, and values? Is there anything missing uh, in our current set? Is there something that came forward in the data that we need to revisit our vision, mission, and values and add in? Is there something we should amplify? And then finally, very important question, we need to gather from you today what at this point in time you are thinking you would like deeper information about what study sessions might we set up so that we can continue the discussion and further understand together implications for the work of the commission in the coming year. So with that, we're gonna go ahead. Um, Rhonda, if uh, you can leave the questions up for a bit, but um, we wanna go back to a whole group discussion and um, talk with each other about these questions. Thanks. Amy, I believe we're gonna turn it back to Chair Sloan, who Perfect. may want to invite public comment at this point. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mary. Um, recording Secretary, do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. The first would be Grace Harm. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hello, everybody. Let me get situated here. It is good to see everybody and good afternoon or a minute too. Uh, my name is Grace Harm and I attend Cal State Fullerton. I'm in their ITEP program and I am a part of the student CTA executive board. And I'm also a CCTC liaison to the executive board for student CTA. In addition, I'm a part of the CTA credential and professional development committee. In SCTA, I work as a co-chair in the committee called Credentialing and Testing, and I'm also in the Committee of Equity. I'm speaking to your strategic plan, and after reviewing with the CPD committee, um, we want to put the emphasis on inclusion, diversity, and equity. I also want to share the emphasis of this data presented on Wednesday and uh, further in today, that it is um, valuable and very important to the members. The data shows that there are also other voices that need to be considered um, in the members in the design of the plan, um, diverse voices among teachers and candidates and new teachers, for example. This is a major priority for the SCTA members and we would like to, or I would like to offer to gather their voices and input on this topic as part of your plan and developmental process. I'd also like to offer some partnership and work together closely in the future because I think that 
the partnership that we would have, I'd be able to provide the insight from the executive board on SCTA and also the members if I would uh, give out a survey, for example. And um, I hope to work together in the future. Thank you all the commissioners for all you do. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harm. That uh, was very helpful uh, in reminding us about one of the really important things that kept coming through in our feedback was about the additional voices of adding in. So thank you very much. According to Secretary, do we have additional public comment? I see Harold. Yes, Harold <laughs> Acord. Thank you. <laughs> Hello again, everyone. Harold Acord um, speaking on behalf of the California Teachers Association. The um, one thing that we want to discuss um, is that we do agree with the ed code um, mandate that you've received as the Commission on Teacher Credentialing as an independent standards board, the oldest one in our country for teacher licensing. And um, we think that those three areas are the appropriate three areas that you should be working in. That should be the frame within which you're working. And um, we also, um, want to talk about the fact that we saw in the data that you shared with us, overwhelmingly people want educators to be able, no matter where they're at in their career, whether they're teacher candidates, whether they are new teachers, whether they are experienced teachers or someone like me who's in just a few years from retirement, that we need to understand diversity, we need to appreciate diversity, we need to confront the implicit biases that we all have, and we need to make sure that we don't use those biases, you know, in a way that we shouldn't be using the biases, we should be making sure that every student we're looking at is through a lens of, um, of not deficiency, but what assets a student has, what a teacher candidate has too. And so we think that's something that's really important. We're gonna wanna talk more about implicit biases in the future. And um, lastly, we also feel that in the area of um, great concern for us around this discussion is we feel to be totally honest that your data is a little bit weak in the area, um, like it's already been mentioned, of getting people who are actually in the classroom, um, getting their diverse opinion. You know, we are the California Teachers Association. We represent the largest um, number of your stakeholders or the people who are actually users of what you do, you know, the work that you do. And um, we feel it'd be easy for you to, to accomplish that. You have, I believe for almost every single person who has a credential in the state, their email, and you would be able to contact all of our members and other people who have credentials. And really, you know, we believe it's important that you solicit their voices to hear the entire diverse voice, voices of the people who are credentialed in this very diverse state. And um, we want to be part of giving the voice to our 300,000 members, but the best way to hear their voice we think is directly from them. And we think you can do that. We think we've gotten into the point of technology and everything that we're able to do that and the information that you should already have that you should be able to solicit beliefs and information around the people who are actually doing the work in the classroom with students. So um, I believe I've covered all my um, things that I needed to say. And again, I appreciate this opportunity to speak on behalf of our members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Acor. Those are excellent points. According secretary, do we have additional comments? We do not have any additional requests. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time then, the public comment period uh, is closed and um, I will turn it back over to Amy to organize um, the discussion with commissioners. Thank you, Tina. So we're hoping to have an open discussion. We'd like to keep it informal in that way. So whoever is um, prepared to speak, let us know and um, we'll call on you. So Rhonda may have to let me know who's putting their hand up, um, but we would like to begin. Perhaps we should um, be clear on which point or question we're speaking to. Maybe we should start with any areas for prioritization, whether it's in the next year or uh, the longer term goal. You could just state that when you speak. I see Johanna Hartwig, Commissioner Hartwig. 
Thank you. Um, and I'm sure that Corey will have more to say from this, but I think in our discussion on Wednesday and at other other times, um, at other commission meetings, we've uh, understood the incredible importance of student voices. And we have a, a very talented and articulate student representative right now. Um, but I think a short-term goal could be um, increasing in the number of ways in which we gather input on a regular basis from students and incorporating and institutionalizing those, I guess I would say, so that there's um, a way that we are able to get uh, direct input from students as well as through representative methods like our, our student liaison who's on the board, um, but that that could be something that could be really looked at across our different program areas. I mean, there's some areas in which uh, student input may not be as relevant, but of course there's lots and lots of areas in which it could be. And um, I know that the commission has made extraordinary leaps and bounds over the last number of years in the communication methods used and the data collected. And so I wanna add my voice to trying to get as much um, student input as possible and making that a, a, a regular part of our um, communication systems. I know that it, it uh, that it has been done, but I'm uh, a voice for amplifying that. And I feel like that could be on the short-term goal um, list that we have. Thanks. Thank you. Who else would like to speak? I see Commissioner Simmons. It seems to me a few years ago, we changed the way that people renew their, or uh, that people apply for their credentials so that it there was actually a survey that came up as part of it. And I know like the, the, the yes answers and all of that has been incorporated into part of the renewal process. Is there a way that we can make a link to a survey as, as teachers renew their credentials every five years? I wonder, Terry, are you, are you online? Do you wanna talk a little bit about the scope of our survey work? I am online and the surveys that are there now take place when people are being recommended for a credential. I think Commissioner Simmons is talking about a new survey that would be for people who are doing their five-year renewals. They're not necessarily have just finished a preparation program, but it would be a way to do a, a dipstick measure with current educators because somewhere under, but somewhere close to one fifth of the educators renew each year. There are still people that have lifetime documents, but majority of people now do have to renew. And that is definitely something technologically that could be developed if we knew what we wanted to survey them about. Great, thank you. Other commissioners, what's resonating with you from last Wednesday and not just last Wednesday, we've had a series of very rich uh, discussions and conversations Thursday and Friday as well. This morning uh, was was a very rich discussion of some strategic work that uh, that we need to be about. What's what's sticking with you? What seems urgent? What seems maybe structural and longer term? Yes, Commissioner Marks. Unmute, please. Yes. Thank you. So one word, assessments. I think the RECA and the assessments and the barriers, they sometimes, they pose to people of color. And if that's our goal, to bring in people of color, then I, assessments is one place I think it's critical to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Janie, would you say that's a, an immediate short term or would you say that's kind of over time? Well, if you're in a teacher prep program now, I would think it's immediate. Um, it depends how long this pandemic lasts. Um, it's long term as far as the legislative um, calendars look. Um, I think it's long term. Mm -hmm. A little of both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Jones, I saw your hand as well. Yes, and I also um, just want to echo, I know that I've said it already like a couple of times, but that student voice is super important. Um, and I know um, Miss Grace Harm, um, Mr. Acord, like they both echoed that same message and it does lack a dimension 
because of that vo because that voice isn't there. Um, however, I do feel like it's important that whatever values that we have as a CTC, that we see where we're remiss in a value. And what I saw was that DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, is one of those values that may have not been represented as well um, as it could. And I think it's citing tangible ways so that in actions that we can represent that value. So I think that's a goal is finding out how can we represent that value within our EEP programs, within our website, within the commission um, and the commissioners. So I think it's just finding tangibles and being able to publicize that too, saying this is how we're reaching our values and give bullet points and, and make that very much known to our um, to everyone who, who crosses paths with the CTC. Thank you so much for that. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my camera, but um, can you hear me at least? Yes, okay. and we can see you. Okay, good. Um, so things that have been on my mind, and obviously Wednesday was a good conversation, um, obviously the DE, DEI, um, one thing that kept, uh, we saw a theme throughout was um, the mental health of people in the profession, um, mental health mm -hmm. of teachers, but I would say all people in the profession. and. Um, one was one was about addressing it in programs, but another then also said studying it. And I also think that goes for obviously our our, our candidates, our our students in their programs. Um, so I think that with this whole COVID has been it's always been important, but I think it's now more prominent in everybody's minds um, because we have people are struggling. Um, you know, mm -hmm. teachers are struggling, administrators are struggling. Um, you know, I. I it's, there's just a big weight on everybody. And so I think, I think immediate is reassessing some of those things. So this is to me is short-term and long-term. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it can't just be a, a two-year goal. I think it has to be, become now an ongoing goal to always keep that in the mindset of whatever we're putting forward, whatever policy, whatever standards, whatever programs, um, that that always has to be in there. And then, um, you know the whole the whole discussion of getting more teachers of color very important um i brought up in my mini group that i think it would be valuable to reach out to high school students and ask them what why aren't you going into the profession i mean the students who are in the programs now in college they chose it and so we need to you know keep them but why are high school students choosing not to go into it you know i've asked a few of my students but you know just a snippet here and there um they're going to give us the answer. How do we change? You know, granted, it's a society thing as well. It's the support of education and how it's viewed um, as opposed to other countries. But why aren't they? Why, why do the students choose not to go into education? You know, so I think that that's a valuable voice that, um, you know, I, I plan on figuring out how to how to survey the students in my own district um, because we are 60% um, Hispanic. And my, my campus has the largest um, um, black student population. So, um, you know, I'm going to be working with our BSU advisor, but I think it's going to be interesting to hear from the students. Why aren't they choosing to go into the profession? What barriers, what society things, what, why is it not important? So. Great. Commissioner Girolo, did I see your hand? I, I do see Commissioner uh, Francois, but Commissioner Girolo first. I, I want to say a couple of things. Um, so, I think short-term, long-term, some of those things can overlap. So, um, you know, someone said testing, testing came up a lot in the surveys, responses, um, all sorts of different aspects of testing and um, revisiting it, thinking about are the tests that we have out there and um, really measuring what we hope that they would measure. And are we putting out better teachers because we have those tests in place? That was someone's comment that came up, um, which I thought was really valuable. Um, also short-term, long-term emergency preparedness. What happens if we have another pandemic? What do we do so we're not scrambling to all of a sudden try to teach 300 plus thousand teachers how to teach online? That's crazy. We shouldn't have had, this should not have happened. We've wasted, not we, but we as, as a country have wasted a whole year educating our kids. I have six kids on Zoom in this house. I mean, it's insane. I didn't have that many devices. It's like, I'm all, use your phone, use whatever you can find, you know? 
So, and I'm seeing the suffering for the kids. So I think short-term, long-term, we need it. We need a better plan for emergency preparedness, oh. whatever that emergency is that's going to come up next. And then I, I felt, I feel the need to throw out a comment that <clears throat> may not be well-received, um, but I need to say it anyway, because it's my last meeting and I've been thinking about it probably my whole life. So, and I don't, I don't mean it to sound like, I know everyone's intent is good when they talk about changing standards that people of color could get into the profession. What message do you think that sends a person of color when they hear somebody say, we better make this easier so that our people of color can pass the test? Well, when I hear that as a person of color, it makes me feel like somebody, somebody thinks that they're gonna take care of me because I'm not smart enough to take care of myself. And that is offensive. And I think that if we, if we listen to the way that we say things, even when our intention is good, and even though we're trying, what we're trying to say is, we want everyone to have access to the same resources, whether it's access to education, access to a family unit that will sit down and read to them at night, whatever that access is, we want equity and, and access to resources. But what it comes out saying is that our people of color aren't quite smart enough to understand what I understand. So therefore I'm gonna make it easier for them so that they can pass. And that's offensive. So I just hope that we can think about a different way of speaking that information because if you ask me, if I was not a teacher for 20 years and you ask me, why, what can, why, why don't you wanna go into education? What can I, how can I make it easier for you to go into education? I would tell you, why would I go into education when I can go work at Google and make 7,000 times as much money as an educator does. Maybe our people of color want to make more money, <laughs> you know? Maybe they don't want to go into teaching. So maybe it's not always about race. And I feel like we, as much as we want to end racism so badly, we continue to glorify it by making everything about race. And so I know that's like a really, it's a very big topic, but it keeps coming up. And, and I know that everyone's, Intentions are not to try to put people down because of the color of their skin, but I think sometimes it does come out that way. When the real issue is deeper, the real issue is about access to resources and you can be any color and have a problem with access to resources. So I think that's probably a long-term thing that we could all work on just in our own hearts. Um, but that is it for those questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Francois. Oh. Thank you. Um, I th so equity, diversity, and inclusion is what really resonates with me um, primarily in this moment. And I think that both short and long term that we should really be thinking about how we can be more clear and transparent about our definitions of those constructs and our goals related to each one of those values. And then what are our guiding principles that ensure that we that everything that we do, every policy that we propose, every action that we propose, every regulation that we propose is weighed against those goals related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think the field needs to, to hear, as I said before, a clear and transparent voice from us as a commission about what our equity, diversity, and inclusion beliefs and values are, and more so how those values are enacted in our standards, in our expectations, in the way that we think about um, addressing misconduct in the profession. That now is the time more than ever for us to center that, and that that should be our test touchstone. Um, there's so much of what Commissioner Hines said that I agree with. And I would say that historically, if we don't address racism and confront it head on and make it always transparent in, in the way that we have an opportunity to, to do right now, what we have experienced as people of color historically is if it's not on the table, if we don't keep challenging racism, then racism continues to exist institutionally and systemically. And as an agency with such a tremendous responsibility for preparing and supporting educators, it is our responsibility, I believe, 
to ensure that we don't take racism off the table, that we acknowledge that educator preparation, whether it's teacher preparation, um, social worker, uh, school site social worker preparation, leadership preparation, Mm -hmm. Our profession is political in nature, and we can pretend that it's not, but it is. And in this moment in particular, the politics of racism needs to be challenged. And as an organization with the responsibility that we have, it would behoove us, it, I believe it is our responsibility to make sure that we're always going back to that. Um, and I also wanted to pick up on this notion of of, of testing and what the data is saying about um, who's passing, who's not passing, who's having to, to retake um, the EdTPA, the RECA, et cetera. And the data is very clear that primarily black people, black teachers, black aspiring teachers are, are in each of those assessments from what I remember from the last day that was presented are not passing at high, as higher as at high rates as, as others. We need to interrogate and explore that. We can't ignore it. And as a black woman, I will say, when I look at that, I do have the same kind of tension that Dr. Hine, uh, Dr. Hine, I'm sorry, that Commissioner Hines has, is that I don't want folks to interpret that data and say, you need to modify the test or dumb down the test so that I can pass it. Because I don't think that's the problem. I don't think that's the root cause. And also, as a, a, a person of color, what I also don't want to happen is for to, to ever have to go into a situation where it's the beginning of a profession, whatever situation, I want to know that I earned my right to be there, that somebody just didn't open a door and say, and push me through, and that I didn't earn it. Because what that does to... To, to my identity and my psyche is I will always have imposter syndrome and I'll always question whether or not I earn that seat at the table. So I think it's a really interesting tension that I think <coughs> many primarily low income um, educators of color have to grapple with. And we need to recognize these kinds of lived experiences. We need to take opportunities to explore them and interrogate them together and bring those students who, who represent that particular perspective to the table to voice into the kinds of policies and procedures that, that we enact. So I guess what I'm trying to say, that was a long way of saying that equity, diversity, and inclusion matters. Student voice absolutely matters. And I believe that there are other ways that we can ensure high quality that does not necessarily come from the results of a test score. Can I just respond real quick? I know I'm out of, out of turn, but I just, want to respond. I just want to clarify. I absolutely agree with you that race should be challenged. Racial Racism should be challenged all the time. But I, what, what I, my point is that I don't think that it's good if we plug in race as the easy way so we don't have to dig deeper and investigate. If the test is the problem, the test is the problem. If Black people are not passing the test, it's not because Black people are stupid. It's because the test is poorly written. You can plug in any race. And if someone's not passing something, it's because the test is, is bad. So if the test is what the problem is, let's change the test. But to say, like, let's get rid of all of our tests because our black and brown students aren't passing them, that's not the answer. Let's fix the test so that it's actually showing what we are looking for it to show. I absolutely agree with you. We need to challenge racism because it exists. It's real. I was saying we're not, we don't need to glorify it by always making every issue a race issue when it doesn't need to be a race issue because then that, that almost takes away the importance of challenging it when it really is a race issue. So I hope I just want to clarify that, that I totally agree with you 100%. Oh, just, no, I didn't think that you disagreed with me. I, did, okay. I didn't. I was expanding upon what you said and what Corey said earlier. And, you know, I would just say, in addition, that, yes, it's the test, but it's all, and it's also, it reminds me of the conversation earlier around 
collaboration across the educational enterprise, because you also can't ignore who's graduating from universities that then can go into teacher preparation. And so we have a, a K-16 interprofessional program access and equity problem that can only be solved through statewide eff efforts across these different agencies. But I was not disagreeing with you. I was building on what right. you said. Okay. So I'm going to clarify. Thanks. Yes, Ms. Jones. I just want to say, um, is it Commissioner Francois? How to say your name? Francois? Yes. Um, amen to all that she said. And I just want to thank also Commissioner Hine to um, having the courage like to say what you just said, because that takes like what you just said, like I don't hear a lot of people just saying it just straight up exactly how you feel. And honestly, I like how you just put that on the table. Um, and I appreciate that in so many ways. Um, I feel I feel like I'm um, just kind of building off of um, Commissioner Francois and what she said. I think when you look at um, a DEI and you know how a lot of times we say DEI lens figuring out what that lens means for the commission. So what is the process you're gonna do to apply to certain areas? So is it going to be like a set of questions you ask yourselves um, when you're looking at an issue or is it going to be um, assessment that you're gonna bring in to, to, to I guess, drive, your, um, drive your, your solutions? So I just wanted to like put that in there too that I know it's a process and you all are going to design that lens. Um, and getting, I know, getting a lot of other people too to see maybe what lens they have. And that might be a good goal to figure out what's that lens going to be and what's our process. Mm -hmm. So, and just to um, summarize a little, the, both a short and long-term goal, obviously. Yes, Commissioner Grenoshire. So I've been listening really carefully and reflecting on the really rich conversations we had on Wednesday and this conversation this morning. And I, I appreciate our collective courage to have this conversation as commissioners. And I, I want us to take the time to think clearly and carefully what a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens mean for all of the work of the commission. Um, Commissioner Francois talked about our goals, our policies, our practices, mm -hmm. um, our work with our, um, our providers. Because as many of you know, there has been lots of conversation among at least the higher ed providers about the need for the commission to be really, really clear about their commitment to work related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think this is exactly the right conversation. Uh, I'm going to ask a process question now, Amy, because I'm, I, I'm reflecting on all that great um, text we had from Wednesday and all the great ideas that came from the subgroups and wanting to have that in front of me, literally, and maybe you posted it and I just did pull it up, to, to, to think through these, these really important conversations. So, so my question is, what's the process? What are the next steps? Because this conversation is absolutely critical but I'm looking at my watch and realizing I have a call at 1245 and I don't want to leave this conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me what the next steps are, please. Yeah. yeah. So, Go ahead, Mary. I'm wondering, Tina, did you want to jump in there? Yes. So I think that uh, the next steps are developing a process and all of the things that uh, people have been generating uh, over the last couple of days is, is helping us uh, figure out what our process is. What I, what I can say that this, what it's not going to be, it's not going to be, we've heard from you, 
we're going to take this now and we're going to create our strategic plan. Because I think that um, what we have here is a real opportunity to get the, the expertise at this table is remarkable. And the feedback that we've gotten so far from stakeholders has been extremely helpful. We are hearing that uh, it behooves us to, begin to get additional feedback from a more diverse um, group of stakeholders. So that could be part of the process. I think what we want to do is be very transparent in um, how we develop our process. And that's something that Mary, Amy, and I are going to do next is sort of brainstorm what our process could be and bring that back to all of you. I think the second thing we want to be sure, obviously, that we are doing is that our process is very inclusive and uh, to be thinking about that. And the third thing, obviously, is, and which I hope we have been doing, is including a number of diverse voices and expertise and experience in the mix. And we know we, we can do more. And we have a lot of information and a lot of excellent ideas um, from the last couple of days that we can start to work with. There are a number of things that we can do. We could put together work groups uh, of commissioners um, to investigate things more deeply. We can um, develop areas where we want to learn more as a commission as we are developing the plan. Um, and that's one question that I do wanna ask you all if we do have time. Um, what, what those areas are, because I think that this is going to be a process throughout 2021. Um, and um, whoever the chair is gonna be can, can help lead that process, I'm not, uh, but uh, until um, the end of this meeting, I'll keep working with uh, Amy and Mary on that. But I think that um, at least that's that's where we are right now, because I, I don't think it's, it we should say that we have something set yet. I think this is a process that we are developing with your input. So where that I think uh, leaves us is, I, I think we, we, in the interest of time, we probably need to uh, either take a long lunch break and plan the afternoon around this or alternatively, bring this to a conclusion. And if there are some last thoughts or some particular suggestions, I, we're, we're hearing very clearly, uh, and we saw this in the data and we know this because of, you know, we're alive and at least partially awake in this world that diversity, equity, and inclusion are utterly critical in front of this commission. And we promised earlier this year, Tina and I did uh, in a letter to the field that uh, we are, uh, committed to looking at the systems that we're involved with here at, this, at the commission to see uh, where we are enabling justice, equity, diversity, um, and where we may be constraining it. And that we think of as is going to be a way of interrogating our systems, our standards, our procedures for, for doing the work we do. Um, to, and, and I think doing some of what you've urged us to do, which include, I, I really appreciated your frame on this, Commissioner Francois, around clarifying our definitions of these constructs and the values that we hold around them and how we are enacting our work around them. And I, I for one, believe we should have a, a deeper conversation about that. You know, let's get concrete and, and less blue sky uh, we know what, what the emerging vision around this is. We want to get someplace important. The next question is, what are we doing that gets us there? What are we doing that may be blocking our progress? And what are the kinds of things we can do to advance that agenda? So that's one area of study that I'm hearing emerge from all of this strategic discussion thus far. I, I also think that, you know, no, I'm, I'm sorry, would you like me, I can stop Commissioner Hartwig, would you like to interject? Okay, I, I wanted to just quickly touch back to the very rich conversation we had just before this one uh, around COVID, clinical practice, the role of preparation and induction, how we make sure our systems, I, you know, one of you spoke to the need for, I think it was Commissioner Dorolo, spoke to the need for an emergency preparedness plan um, and we are, you know, building this plane as we're flying it in every conceivable way right now. But 
what a learning experience that is for all of us to see how well our systems are designed to meet this moment. Um, and I think that's also another critical area of work is looking at the whole kind of preparation continuum to see, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we keep this workforce in strong development and build the infrastructure to support that uh, so that, you know, we have the opportunity to recruit and retain the workforce that we need for our public schools. So there is no end to good work for us to do. And I'm really looking forward to working with the chair and vice chair on developing what the next steps will be um, as we get ready for our February meeting. And I'm sorry, Commissioner Johanna Hartwig. Oh, I just wanted, before we wrapped it up, I wanted to say first, thank you for this incredible conversation that we've just had. I really um, appreciated it and a lot of food for thought. Before we wrapped up, I wanted to just jump in with, I know our fourth question was um, ideas for study sessions. Uh, and so I wanted to jump in with a, a request for a study session focused on um, testing regimens and um, assessment as someone who is by profession not steeped in this, you know, in this world. Um, I think I would really benefit from a study session that would help me understand um, our, our testing and assessment current status and options and um, liabilities and benefits uh, from those, that would be uh, very helpful for me. Thanks. Okay. I know we have important questions related to that coming up mm -hmm. no matter what. And so Absolutely. I would like to be prepared. Thank you. Well, seeing no other hands, we thank you for your, uh, for your work with us on all of this. And we're grateful to be able to work with all of you. Uh, on, on this important time of framing next steps. So Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you so much, Amy and Mary, again, for everything that you have been doing around this. And Amy, especially, you were working, you and your staff yesterday on sifting through the data once again and, and organizing things for us, appreciate it. Okay, this was an information item and no action is needed. So with that, we will move to item 1I. Agenda item 1I is report of the closed session items. Commissioner Hind, would you please? Yeah, give me one second to pull it up. Okay. <clears throat> Staff briefed the commission on the cases of Kathleen Carroll v. Commission on Teacher Credentialing et al. Commission on Teacher Credentialing v. Kathy Little, Simone Kovats, Deborah Sather, and Star Ann Myers, and Linda Stern v. California Commission on Teacher Credentialing does 1 through 25, and no reportable action was taken. Staff briefed the commission on the case of Juan M. Jaimes v. California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and the commission tabled the matter to a future meeting. The commission granted the following petitions for reinstatement. Ronnie Joseph... Larry Newton, Delman Porter. The commission denied the following petitions for reinstatement. David Ecria, Armando Rodriguez. The commissioner tabled Sergi Carr's petition for reinstatement to a future meeting. The commission rejected the proposed decision in the matter of Tina McIntyre and called for the transcript. The commission adopted the following proposed decisions. Catherine Bates, Sergio Galvez, Nathan Jackson, Jay Jasper. The commission discussed the following consent calendar items and remanded the matters back to the committee on credentials. Number 26, Jonathan Phil. Number 29, Jesus Garcia. Number 37, Vera Gomez. Number 63, Mark Meredith. Commissioner Martin recused herself on the Tina McIntyre matter and the Mark Meredith matter. Commissioner Jackson recused herself on the Nathan Jackson matter. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Commissioner Hind. Uh, item 1J is new business. The bi-monthly agenda is presented for information. Reporting Secretary, are there any audience presentations? No, there are no audience presentations. Thank you. All right. Um, Yesterday, I didn't get to do the chair's report. We were gonna move that item to today because according to the policy manual, there are two uh, 
things that the chair does at the end of the year. One is uh, summarize the, some of the accomplishments of the commission for the year, and the other is report out on the review for the executive director that commissioners uh, provided input on. And I know it has been a, a very long meeting for all of you. So um, many of you commissioners have received information on what um, the accomplishments were this year. And uh, so I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but I do want to emphasize that there were 32 specific um, <clears throat> goals and priorities that uh, commissioner or executive director, Mary Sandy set at the beginning of the year. And uh, of those, a tremendous amount of accomplishments have been um, completed, I should say. Um, some of the milestones were things like the um, completion and launch of CalSAS, which was the um, automation of the annual assignment monitoring. That was a very big thing. Uh, the accreditation dashboards, um, the completion of the TPA comparable uh, comparability study, that was also a very big thing. And then the expansion of the CTC online system to um, allow direct electronic recommendations for CTE credentials, GLATS, CLATS, and uh, a number of other things. There's more to go there too. And then there was a lot of new priority areas in 2021 that uh, we made uh, progress on, such as adoption of the TPEs and subject matter requirements for the theater and dance credentials. That was another big accomplishment. And then we began the development of the new TPA for special education. Um, we met um, with the sponsors of the master plan committee to discuss the commission's work in early childhood education. We continue to make progress in, in that front. And I would say that um, probably the other really important thing that didn't stop in this time of COVID was convening the design team to update the California standards for the teaching profession. Uh, and the subject matter requirements for the bilingual authorization program, all incredibly important things. There were a few areas of work that were delayed due to COVID-19, but I want to emphasize that the delays were really external to our work. The delays were not commission staff uh, were too overwhelmed or too busy or had to work from home and these things couldn't get done. Those include things like the passage of the legislation that uh, Sasha Horowitz talked to us about today. Uh, they include things like the establishment of the work group to review the RECA. They include things like the standard setting study on the Cal APA, which we had to postpone given the settings that changed so dramatically in terms of when the APA could be done the expansion of grant programs for residencies and classified staff and computer science, again, uh, beyond our control. Um, so I just want to say that the commission, the staff, those of us sitting here, the executive director have done an amazing job during this time of COVID. I think all of you know that. We talked about how much harder the work has been this year. And on top of accomplishing the goals that they set out to accomplish earlier in the year before any of this crisis hit, they did none of the things on the list that I just mentioned involve the thousands and thousands of hours and thought that went into figuring out how we are going to work with our entire stakeholder community to ensure that California students and families have excellent teachers and administrators and counselors and nurses in the classrooms in 2021. And that's what they've done. So I want to commend all of you sitting here and I want to commend the staff and executive director Sandy on tremendous job well done. And I've seen Corey giving her snaps <laughs> Thank you. The other thing that, uh, uh, according to the policy manual that uh, the chair uh, and vice chair will be doing is um, providing you with information about your feedback on the executive director's uh, performance this year. And, and for that, I would um, like to say that uh, Vice Chair Hind and I had a conversation with Mary about this uh, 
earlier in the week, and I would like um, Vice Chair Hind to start with her comments. Hey, thank you. Um, so this is, I don't know how many surveys uh, I've been able to look at of Mary's. Um, hiring Mary was one of the first charges that um, came before the commission when I was uh, first on the commission. And they've always been good. They've always been great. This one is like the best. She, so, I mean, you, you all, we all, um, out of the areas, uh, the competency areas, uh, vision, mission, and strategy, everyone who responded was extremely satisfied. Um, achievement of results, everyone was extremely satisfied, one very satisfied. Um, people management, again, the same, every single area, people management, program management, fiscal management, the commission staff relationship, commission meeting management, external liaison, public image, other expectations, everything was, every, everyone was extremely satisfied and a few very satisfied in there. So that was just, it was really telling to see. And then when we started looking at the comments um, that people wrote on there, I'll just read a couple of the, um, the notable comments that, that commissioners wrote without names who said it, of course, because <clears throat> we don't know that information, but um, Mary demonstrates in a number of ways through verbal and written communications and presentations, her deep understanding of both the mission and strategy of the CTC. She's a thoughtful spokesperson to a large number of constituents. And another one, this has been a year of unanticipated difficulties and executive director Sandy has stepped up to meet the challenge. She has helped the commission take key steps to support credential holders and applicants during the pandemic and she also worked hard to create a supportive atmosphere, atmosphere for her team. Executive Director Sandy is to be commended for her leadership this year. <clears throat> Executive Director Sandy cultivates very positive relationships with commissioners through setting a highly professional while extremely friendly tone. She takes the extra effort to reach out to commissioners individually and check in with them. I feel very well supported in my service by Executive Director Sandy. And then through our... Um, our meeting with the chair um, and executive director Sandy, some of the things that, that I wrote down um, based off of people's individual comments and just our conversation. Um, you know, Mary's not afraid to challenge the status quo. She is wanting and willing to collaborate with all of us, but also with all of our stakeholders, anyone in the field who wants to be heard to really figure out, is this the best way to do something? Um, you know, she understands that nobody can solve problems or move the establishment anywhere alone. And so she never seeks to do that on her own. She's always looking for people around to, to move our, the mission forward. And that's always the forefront of her mind is how can we get to where we want to be? Um, she sees collaboration as an opportunity, not as something that is intimidating. Um, she knows that diversity takes on many forms, diversity, of race, ethnicity, gender, diversity of personal, professional experience and diversity of thought. And she welcomes that diversity of thought at our table. Um, and so I think in closing of the diversity of thought, she's um, reminding me that in order to take advantage of all that diversity has to offer, uh, we need to achieve diversity of all those categories to so really bringing all that richness that each of us has to offer, but also all the constituents, all the, everyone in the state of California who cares about education, she's like, bring it, bring it to the table and let's make it happen. So amazing survey results, not surprising at all. Um, she's definitely the best executive director that we could possibly have for this commission. And I was telling her, um, you know, one thing, if, if she decided to quit today and to walk away from the commission, she has set up the foundation and created the structure that the commission could go on and continue working toward me getting to our mission, making that a reality. And that's what a true leader does. So thank you so much, Executive Director Sandy. And um, I will miss you, but I'll, I'll watch you guys on TV. It'd be cool. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair Hine. Um, and by the way, uh, Executive Director Sandy hates this but uh, she has to be put through it. And Com Vice Commissioner Hind is, cor is correct. This, this was um, a, a remarkable, just a remarkable view, uh, review of her comments, I mean, of her accomplishments this year. And just to add what uh, Alicia said, um, Executive Director Sandy has this depth of expertise that we're really remarkably fortunate to have as a leader. We saw that throughout the comments. 
the other part, the collaborativeness of her, her leadership, as um, Alicia talked about, you can't talk to Mary about what she's doing without her um, uh, immediately interjecting the expertise of her staff and the uh, incredible staff that she has and why the commission is capable of doing what they're doing, why she's capable as a leader of doing what she's doing. It always comes back to the staff uh, that she collaborates with and us. That's the other thing she talks so highly about. She has nothing but remarkable things to say about every member of this commission. And, um, and I think we see that every time that we meet. Um, uh, I, we're all appreciative of what all of you do and bring here. Last thing I'll say is that Executive Director Sandy really embodies the humanness of what we do. Um, and there's a comment um, that um, brings this home for me. And it's uh, one of the many things that makes her a remarkable leader. Uh, Director Sandy is passionate about the commission's mission. She's an excellent communicator. She has sound judgment in that Dr. Sandy has the ability to sift through alternatives, deliberate in their right, and then arrive at a sound decision. Director Sandy is authentic. She truly cares about all the staff and commissioners, students, and the profession. When we were first shut down, she personally reached out to check on us to see how we were doing. That is true leadership. That was the comment, so... Thank you, Mary. Thank you for all you do for us. <laughs> Hi, can I just say, commissioners, um, I'm not sure who you're talking about, but um, <laughs> thank you very much for your support and uh, your, your extremely positive feedback and uh, that we're all rowing in the same direction so vigorously is uh, what an opportunity what a great opportunity I feel it is to be here uh, in this moment, in this time with the challenges that we have and they are mighty challenges, but um, this community of commissioners and staff and stakeholders are action oriented and have a vision that I live for. And so thank you for allowing me to be here and to serve in this role with all of you. And. Um, uh, let's minimize, you know, shorter, shorter sentences next time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. With that, we will move to item 1K. <laughs> item 1K is nominations and elections of the chair and vice chair of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing for 2021. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Mary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Section 301 of the Commission's Policy Manual allows for nominations for the chair and vice chair to be made orally in open session at the last meeting of the calendar year of the Commission. Are there any nominations for chair? Commissioner Durillo. I would like to nominate Tina Sloan for the position of chair. Are there other nominations? Seeing no other nominations, I now close nominations for chair. Are there nominations for the position of vice chair? Commissioner Cooney? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, nominate for vice chair Commissioner uh, De La Torre Escobedo. Thank you. Are there other nominations for chair or vice chair? Seeing none, I know we'll now close uh, nominations for the vice chair. So before we open the election, I would like to ask your nominee for chair to give a brief statement. Commissioner Sloan. Um, I'd just like to thank you for um, well, giving me the opportunity to um, to chair this, this amazing commission again this year. Um, it has been quite a year. Um, and, and the thing I keep that keeps coming back to me whenever I sit before you and listen to you mm -hmm. is how educating is a caring profession. Mm -hmm. And I include all of the certified and classified staff and the educators who are part of this caring commission. And I think it's what makes our work so challenging and worthwhile because um, it is such a caring. Um, and I 
believe that this is probably one of the hardest professional years I've ever had. And I believe it's probably for many of you the same. And it's also though, um, it's, it's also been an eye opening opportunity year. Um, and I am really hopeful of the kinds of things that we can bring from this and what we're gonna do, uh, our discussion around the strategic planning has just been so exciting to me. And I think we have a real opportunity to do something um, better for our kids for our students and for our families and for our educators and for our new educators. And uh, the people who are here are in this room are gonna make that happen. I truly believe that you're, you're all remarkable. So thank you. Thank you. I will now open the election for the chair of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Do I have a motion to elect Tina Sloan as the chair for 2021? So moved. By Commissioner Martinez, seconded by Commissioner DiRolo. Will the recording secretary please call the roll? Kirsten Barnes? Aye. C. Michael Cooney? Aye. Aye. Marisol Delatore Escobedo? Aye. Johanna Hawick? Aye. Alicia Hong? Aye. Terry Jackson? Aye. Bonnie Clark? Aye. Kevin Kung? Aye. Jim Marks? Aye. Cynthia Martin? Monica Martinez? Aye. David Simmons? Aye. Tina Sloan? You know, it occurred to me, I'm not sure if I should be abstaining. Is that what I should do? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Vote for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries. Very good. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Chair Sloan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I would now like to present Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo as the nominee for Vice Chair. Would you like to make a statement? Yes, Director Sandy. Thank you. Um, I have to say, uh, going through the strategic planning session on Wednesday, um, it just made me realize how much I've learned while being on the commission. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, you know, uh, talked to us about all the acronyms that we need to learn and everything else, but it was, it was really ref refreshing knowing everything in the glossary as we were going through uh, all the items there. But, you know, there's a deep history uh, within our work here and, you know, it's been such a roller coaster of a year. And I am, you know, truly excited about the future and what's to come. Um, I'd be honored to serve next to um, Madam Chair Sloan to continue our work in carrying out the mission and vision of the CTC. And, you know, with our current realities with COVID and more, um, you know, this just, and we've experienced this at our meeting, just in terms of the deep implications on our students and our teachers, and it's going to magnify so many issues, but we're keeping those at the forefront in terms of working alongside our stakeholders and more uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we have the kids, the kids in mind here and our teachers. Um, in my family um, and, you know, culturally with my own children, um, I've always been taught, you know, to recognize those that came before you. Um, and I want to recognize, you know, those whose roots are deeply planted um, in our work. Um, so Kirsten, Alicia, and Terry, um, you are all such Hall of Famers in our educational world. Um, I thank you for everything you've done um, and everything that you will continue to do. Um, and with that, I'm looking forward to 2021 and what's to come. Thank you. I will now open election for the vice chair. Do I have a motion to elect uh, Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo for vice chair? Uh, Commissioner Kung moved, seconded by Commissioner Jackson? 
Thank you so much. Will the recording secretary please call the roll? Kirsten Barnes. Aye. C. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol de la Torre Escobedo. Aye. Johanna Howick. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Terry Jackson. Aye. Bonnie Clark. Aye. Kevin Kung. Aye. Jen Marks. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Tina Sloan. Aye. Motion carries. Commissioners, it is my pleasure to introduce Tina Sloan as the chair and Marisol de la Torre Escobedo as the vice chair of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing for 2021. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, this has been quite uh, an end of year meeting. And uh, at, as we uh, adjourn, I want to, because I didn't get to yesterday, please just say to Kirsten, thank you for your time here. You always keep it real uh, for us. Uh, your stories of students and families, it's the, your, your commitment and care for the kids and the people that you work with just comes through in everything you say and do. And the expertise that you uh, bring to bear on these issues is really different from the rest of us. And I have learned so much from you. And you have served this commission, the commitment and the time and the effort in eight years, you've shaped so much that have come before us. And I want you to know that you are a voice in my head and, and you will still be here when you leave this table. And I thank you for that. And Alicia, your 10 years of service on this commission, um, you've brought so much expertise and a whole variety of experiences to bear on this work. I mean, you just kept growing as an educator throughout your time here and we have benefited on all of this. I mean, when I think about what you do, you've educated me with examples directly from your classrooms when uh, you were teaching. And then you went in to become, um, you working on the administrator credential and you informed us on that work and the APA and with virtual school. And as a parent of six children from home, my goodness, that always informed us. You mentored new teachers in the profession. And just as a member of the profession, um, your intellect and your expertise really shaped our work here. And one of the things that I could always count on with you was uh, to speak your mind, to challenge the issues, to challenge us. And as um, Corey Jones said earlier, to keep it real. Um, you've shaped so much of our work over the past decade and I've learned so much from you. And you are a voice in my head and will be after you leave this table. And I thank you so much for that. And finally, Terry. Terry, um, I have uh, already said many things to you and about you in public, um, but the one thing I want to say here is that you're, you are one of the, the people that whenever I look at you, I just see this deep commitment and in some ways I think sacrifice to the work. I mean, you work so hard always and, and you have to have loved it because you couldn't have uh, maintained that all of these years without loving it. And at the same time, I now wish for you, um, I think as some, some of our other commission members or members of the public said, greener pastures. Um, I, I just, just wanna thank you for everything that you've done here. All right, so with that, I now adjourn the December 2020 meeting of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. The next meeting is on February 11th and 12th in 2021. Take care, commissioners, and I, I wish you a good rest of the year. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Be safe. Happy hour. Bye. Happy Thanks. hour, yeah. <laughs>
Kristen. Kristen, I love you. <laughs> this is not goodbye. No. This is not no. for now. Yeah. No, Alicia and I will come up and hold the, the restaurant for you guys. Excellent. Yes. Hold the table. We're, we're yep. coming. Yep. And I'll be there. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'll good. be there. <laughs> Oh, Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.